Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Feline Masterclass with me, Dr. Liz Bales. Um, I'm so excited to come and talk with you again tonight. Uh, and I'm, I don't I really want to thank Base Pause for having us back. Um, if you, this whole month we're talking about senior cats, and uh, tonight is going to be a big treat. And Base Pause is doing so much amazing work to get to the genetic root of problems and try to extend cats' lives by 25% by the year 2025, which is phenomenal. Um, but we want quality of life in addition to quantity of life. So tonight I have an incredibly special guest to talk with you. Um, Dr. Michael Delgado is in a class of, uh, you know, I, I am a good old veterinarian and there's lots of me, uh, but there really is only one Michael Delgado. And if you know <laughs> any um, uh, New York, New Yorker or like pretty much anything where they ask a scientist, it's probably Dr. Delgado. So can you explain to us how you got to this role? Sure. Um, first of all, just thank you so much, Liz and Base Pause, for having me. I'm really excited to talk about um, one of my favorite topics, which is senior cat behavior. Um, I am a cat behavior consultant and a scientist. I have been working with cats for over 20 years. I got my start in an animal shelter and realized that I really wanted to better understand the things I was observing, like stressed out cats, uh, broken relationships between humans and their cats, that were, was leading cats to end up surrendered to shelters. And that is when I decided to go back to school. I was a college dropout. You know, when I was <gasps> in my twenties, I just, <laughs> I just wanted to play in rock bands. Amazing. I didn't yeah. know that. Well, I hope yeah. it's inspiring to everybody out there who might have gotten, gone a different path and feel like maybe you want to return to some sort of academics. It's look at you. I didn't 100%. know. That. Yeah. Yeah. So I dropped out of college, moved to California, you know, did a bunch of things. And then it was actually, I started volunteering in the shelter and then realized I loved it and wanted to dedicate my life to working with cats. And that's kind wow. of what turned my life around. And then, yeah, I decided I should really finish that college degree. And then I realized I really loved research. I loved science. I loved behavior, decided to get a PhD. And then after my PhD, I worked at the um, School of Veterinary Medicine at UC Davis, where you came and visited and gave a talk. Um, that was super fun. And um, so, yeah, th really, that was part of my journey of becoming a scientist, but really um, my true passion is just helping people understand cats, whatever it takes. I do, you know, consultations with clients. I try to do events like this. I write, I do a blog. So it's really about trying to uh, make information accurate, you know, scientifically based information that improves the welfare of cats available to humans. So we've got, yeah. we've got Francis here from Vancouver, Canada, nice. dropping in to say hello. So this this kind this information goes everywhere, which is amazing. Um, let's let's dig in. So, okay. senior cats, why does behavior matter? Yeah, I think when you know most of us are not veterinarians, and so we rely very heavily on our veterinarians to give us cues about our pet's health, right? Including doing diagnostics. I can't do a blood test at home. I can't do a urine test at home. I don't. I can't look at my cat and just know intuitively always what's going on. So we have to use behavior to kind of judge what our cats are thinking and feeling. And so really, behavior is important, especially when we're talking about seniors, because sometimes we see behavior changes before we've gotten those diagnostics done, before we know our cat has a disease. And it's really important, no one knows your cat's behavior better than you. You live with your cat, you know there's a feeling in your gut when something's not quite right and when something's off. And so I'm, I'm really encouraging people to tune into their cat's behavior, be observers of behavior, be a scientist, and really think about um, some changes that you observe. And I think it's really important to um, you know, you may have heard this in some of the previous talks, I think a lot of us say this, aging is not a disease, right? You know, you don't necessarily, um, we know frailty and aging are not necessarily correlated. Some of us, um, you know, experience a lot of disease or um, troubles as we age. Some of us age very well without aches and pains or different health problems and the same is true for our cats. So it's really important to understand that, you know, many cats can be active 
until later in their life. They can be very healthy. And some cats are going to have challenges and you're going to be um, working with your veterinarian to help your cats age as well as they can with great quality of life. It's important to recognize the life stages. So there's different, I don't know, like I, like I see different ages as when cats are technically considered a senior. Do you agree that it's 11 or do you so, think you like know, mature think is some wiggle room and it's a little yeah. bit arbitrary, but right. the AFP senior cat guidelines, I think are over 10. Okay. What they just put out, but gotcha. yeah, um, you know, yeah. Age is a number, but yeah. So, so cats who are, you know, getting to be around 10 are considered senior. That's when you're going to want to ramp up your veterinary care, start getting twice a year checkups. Geriatric is 15 plus. So that's, you know, the equivalent of someone who's probably in their eighties. And I definitely, I know when my cats were geriatric, they saw the veterinarian a lot more than twice a year. So we tried to do like quarterly. Think, uh, we're, you're, um, you're giving a grace year I, it, for AFP. I think it's 14 plus. Okay. Then just for structure, they're saying um, minimum of four visits a year. Minimum Perfect. Four visits. Yeah, yeah, I think that's great. I the sooner the Belladonna, what a cool name. Oh, nice. Um, but so I and, and I want to circle back because yeah. you were saying age is not a disease. So if I'm seeing changes in my cat, like, oh, yeah, she doesn't really climb the stairs at night with me anymore. Or like she doesn't want to play anymore, but she's just getting old. She must just be getting old. We shouldn't be brushing that off. Is that what you mean? Agreed. Yes. We want to really consider, um, you know, what we could be doing to maintain those behaviors, maintain, um, you know, of course, your your cat is going to age and there are going to be changes and not all of them are like, oh my goodness, like there's a problem, um, you know, but there are things that might mean you can do some things to help them. Maybe they need pain control. Maybe they need um, some ways to get around the house more easily. Maybe they need a different type of play. Maybe they need some changes to where you're keeping their food and water dishes. So it's really about not just um, like, oh, all change is bad because, you know, there's some really great changes personally that I think come with, with aging in cats. Like they often become a little more cuddly and heat seeking and I always used to, um, I always call cats raisins because they get older, you know, they get smaller and sweeter each year as they get older. <laughs> so that's kind of my pet name for senior cats. But, um, you know, you really want to look at, you know, are you seeing like, oh, suddenly they're not eating as much as they used to. They're not playing. Oh, they're not grooming. They're looking a little greasy and unkempt. Um, maybe they don't seem to hear you as well as they used to, or maybe they seem like their vision's fading. And I'm always concerned about personality changes, things like hiding more often, um, avoiding contact with people, uh, maybe seeking really extreme temperature changes, like suddenly they want to be on cool surfaces or um, that would be, I, to you know, I think it's pretty normal for cats to seek out warm surfaces. But, you know, if you're seeing things that seem a little off, then it's a good time to talk to your veterinarian and just make sure everything's okay. In doubt, check it out. That's my, that's my yeah, motto don't have a ton of ways to show us um, that something's wrong. So the same exactly. sign could be medical and it could just be behavioral or, or situational. Mm -hmm. um, and it does really help to rule out the medical first yes. um, and then, and then move on if hopefully everything is good there. Yes. hundred um, percent. Yeah. So like I said, you know, Everyone who lives with their cat hopefully is more going to recognize these changes and just trust your gut. You know your kitty. If something seems wrong, go to the veterinarian and then you can come up with a plan. And really the the rest of what I've prepared is, is really about environmental things that you can do to help your senior cat cope with aging. Um, you know, it's like I said, it's not a disease, but it is it is a process that will require some support. I guess that's the way I like to put it. And Janet just um, chimed in. Hi, Janet. Talking about um, CBD for senior kitties and that most vets don't approve of it. But I, I got to give a shout out here because this is evolving science. And we actually are bound by a lot of legal rules. And until um, the, there's more proven data about CBD, then we're really handicapped in what we can talk about. Not even, even if we're fully informed, we, we are not permitted to recommend things that don't have a scientific background. Um, so 
so prohibited, I should say. So, <laughs> so I, I would just add to that, you know, a lot of the, the pain research um, done by Duncan LaSalle's lab, you know, they are, they find a very strong placebo effect uh, when it comes to um, pain control with supplements. And it's really important to recognize that if you're giving your pet something that has not had rigorous research showing that it's effective, you may be denying your cat the actual effective pain control that they need. And you may be, in fact, a lot of studies show that people see improvement even when they're giving their cat a placebo and they don't know and their cat is not improving. So it's really important to recognize that um, one of the, the reasons that we may not recommend, or you know, I don't recommend medications, I'm not a veterinarian, but um, you know that we really stick to the science is just, we don't want people giving their cats things that are not going to help them, in, especially instead of giving them things that we know are effective. So it gets it gets um, almost political. So we'll leave it there because then sure. I'm not gonna fight tonight. I have teenagers and I am played out of fights. <laughs> yeah. But all right. So how do how can we tell? How do I yeah. know that I, that we've got a pain situation here? Yeah, and I, you know, there's the feline grimace scale is probably the most validated tool. It's a very recent tool. It's um, very simple to use. This is not really a diagnostic tool for for people to use in their home. It's it's used in clinics, but I think it provides a really quick and easy guide to what a non-painful cat looks like and what a very painful cat looks like and kind of what the changes are. So if you look on the left hand side, that's a cat who is not feeling pain. Their eyes are open their face is relaxed, their whiskers are like drooping slightly, looking, you know, kind of not tense, um, and their head is upright. And as we get further to the right, we've got a cat who is experiencing moderate pain in the middle. You can see the eyes are starting to get a little squinty, the ears are starting to move apart from one another. We've got a little hunching of the head. We've got whiskers tightening up a little bit. And you'll see um, cats who are painful often are in a kind of hunched position. So if your cat is in that position a lot, that is one potential thing you should be looking for. You're not necessarily going to see limping or something that's really obvious. It is going to be subtle, like your cat choosing not to jump on the table or not moving as much, um, sitting in a tense position a lot. And the cat on the right-hand side is in a lot of pain. I'm and so you super excited by the fact of this tool because yeah. we say all the time that cats are masters at hiding their pain. Yeah. I'm ready to put the blame on us. <laughs> once you understand this, it, my own evolution, um, when, when this stuff was coming out, we got sent, um, lots of different feline veterinarians got sent lots of pictures of cat faces and they're like, which one's in pain? And we mm -hmm. would, and I was terrible at it. Sure. sure. And I was like, you can't tell. They all look like <laughs> And now that someone has pointed this out so clearly, I, I I now can can tell. So I don't know if cats are masters at hiding their pain, but we have been pretty bad at seeing their signs. 100%. So this tool really helps us a lot. Agreed. Yes, I think it's great. So this is just, like I said, a, a quick and easy guide. Um, and, you know, yeah, like Liz said, we're not here to kind of debate what treatment is right for your cat. That's really a conversation you should have with your veterinarian. And um, I do want to talk, though, about um, kind of stepping away from the health-based stuff and really getting into the behavior and environment. So um, I kind of went through kind of the highlights of what I thought, like, everyone with a senior cat should be thinking about. These are really important things to your kitty. There may be more. So if you have questions, we're here to answer them and discuss. So what you're saying is... You can't go wrong by providing these environmental changes to help your cat out. Yes, these are these are my my picks for um, what I think are are the most important. And I'd say number one is making sure the litter box is set up well for a senior kitty. And um, this is something you know a lot of cats do. Older cats have um, litter box issues. That can actually be one of the first indicators of a health problem. So when someone contacts me with a 12 year old cat who's used their litter box faithfully until last week, first thing you do, go to the veterinarian. There's so many medical issues that can lead to litter box avoidance. But we want to make sure the litter box is set up appropriately for a senior cat. A litter box that maybe was fine for your cat before may no longer work for them. And I think that really confuses people because they're like, well, was, he was fine with it before. He's not the same physical kitty that he was before. He might have 
joint pain. He might be a little bit heftier. He might have a harder time getting into that top loading litter box, which I don't recommend anyway, but I especially don't recommend them for uh, senior cats. So you really want to think about what is the easiest thing for my older cat to walk into, not what climb that, into. What, what's your favorite? Like if people could just have, go to the store and buy <laughs> one litter box, what would it be? Yeah, that box doesn't really exist. Um, I hate yeah. that. <laughs> so I'm a big fan of the homemade uh, modified litter box out of a storage bin. You can cut holes in it to, that suit your cat's needs. I think this is a really great example of a litter box with a nice low entryway for a cat. Um, this is accommodates um, large cats. It accommodates cats who can't step up or jump up. And it also can accommodate um, high, high peers, as I call them, as long as they are angled at the right um, direction. But you can see this cat has plenty of room to move around, find a clean spot. Um, it's easy to get into. There are other, um, you know, there are some litter boxes that are low-sided. There's a, a few senior ones. They're not as large as I would like. Um, personally, I'm a big fan of, of really giant litter boxes, and I think most cats prefer them as well. Um, but some of the other really important things are, are having several litter boxes um, in really easy to access areas. So it's not just the size of the box. It's like not having it in a closet, not having it in the garage, not having your cat have to jump through a cat door to get to it. And think about, you know, we want a restroom on every floor of our house. Your senior cat needs easy access to those litter boxes because they're gonna be peeing more. They might have to poop more urgently. Um, but with a lot of um, the diseases that we see in older cats, it can affect their output. And often it affects that they have to pee more frequently. So it, you really don't want them to have to trudge down three flights of stairs to go to the bathroom every time. So look, it's hard to tell on this litter box because it just looks like a cat in a litter box. But if you think about it, most of the litter boxes barely fit a cat. Mm -hmm. And this one if you look at it, you could probably fit three to four of these cats in here. So how big is that? Yeah, we generally recommend that the box is as long as the cat from the tip of their nose to the end of their tail. So about one and a half times their body length. I usually recommend starting with um, at least 22 to 28 inches long is like kind of a good range with um, the width being like 18 to 20 inches is ideal. Um, so I just go to Target or, you know, whatever your favorite container type store is and get a storage bin. There's different ways that you can cut entryways into them. I use a Dremel. I know people that use like a soldering iron or even some kind of more manual like a box knife. So if you don't have fancy tools, but you do yeah. have a knife, it can make really sharp edges and it's yeah. quite hard to do. And I don't want anyone cutting themselves. Yeah, no, true. I was, um, I was rocking away trying to cut my litter box and my, then I think she was 10 year old daughter walked in the room. It's like, ma, why don't, you, why don't you heat up that knife on the stove? <laughs> And I was like, oh, I'm raising a scientist that's smarter than her. Nice. If yeah. you heat up your X-Acto knife yeah. over a burner, it just slices through like butter. Yeah. So it's easier, but it also leaves that nice, um, smooth edge because it can be rough enough to cut. Yeah. Yeah. No, good point. So, yeah, I mean, there's there's a few good um, guides online to, to modifying your own litter box. Um, but, you know, I, I think that the main thinking is, I mean, you could use like a low sided, like a sweater bin. That's pretty easy for a cat to climb into. But the idea is large, easy to get into and very accessible to your cat. And then, of course, if you're um, I recommend scooping twice a day. And certainly if your cat has um, kidney disease or diabetes, you are going to probably need to scoop more than twice a day to keep it clean. So that's really important. And why the enzyme cleaners? What is that about? Yeah, um, well, I will say you are, as your cat ages, you're probably more likely to have the occasional accident. That is part of aging animals. Um, so, you know, acceptance is part of this, which is why I'm also a big fan of puppy pads and waterproof blankets. There comes a point where um, we might be doing some problem solving, but we're also doing some management. So having those tools handy can reduce the stress. You're just like, okay, I'm just going to clean this up. I'm going to use something that works really well. I love anti icky poo unscented because it does not smell like cleaner. It um, it's very effective and it doesn't make my house smell. Um, but you know, I think um, just being prepared is going to be a huge step um, because a lot of people are not prepared for when their cat can't make it to the litter box every time, or certainly um, towards the end of their life where they might actually be incontinent and you're 
really just managing them until you decide the time is right for them to um, be humanely euthanized. And the other thing I would say is that sometimes you have to think even more extremely outside the box. So I'm a fan of some alternatives like dishwasher pans, cookie sheets, and puppy pad holders. These are all acceptable litter boxes depending on the cat and their needs. So I've definitely had clients talk to me about a dishwasher pan. What is that? <laughs> yeah. They're big, they're low-sided, they can hold a small amount of soft kitty litter or puppy pads, um, but these are great for cats with severe uh, degenerative joint disease. So those are cats who might not be able to move very well at all. Um, this does allow them to basically just walk right in. Um, so I they can, can be that at like a Home Depot? Yeah, you can um, get them definitely at any type of home um, supply store. You can get them online. Um, like I said, I've had a few cats who really liked cookie sheets um, to use as a litter box. So they really just didn't um, didn't do well with sides on the litter box. So sometimes we really just have to make it barely a litter box. And sometimes when you've had ongoing problems, you do have to kind of start with a new setup to kind of reset. And yeah. these are some, some good options if you have a cat, especially if they, again, have really serious um, joint issues. Fantastic. That's really yeah. different. So um, then there's the other kind of environmental adjustments that people may or may not be thinking of. Um, I do really, um, you know, you really want to think about the impact on the joint. So even if your cat is not showing signs of pain, um, I'll just speak for myself, like my last kitty who um, passed away last year, she was 16 and a half. And she had a lot of she had large cell lymphoma. But when we were diagnosing her cancer, she had x rays and we found out she actually had a lot of spinal degeneration that we didn't know about because she wasn't so showing any signs. I mean, we had ramps and steps, but she was still jumping on things like three feet high and playing and- Talking with um, with Dr. Sherrick last week about this. When I when when we take x-rays of cats for any reason, the, yeah. the size of them, they really fit on a one cassette. We call it a catagram because we're- <laughs> But, you know, be taking pictures of uh, maybe for a block cat that's three years old, Mm -hmm. And the number one place, I would just be shocked at the changes in the spine. Wow. At a very young age. And, and it was, it's a lot of cats. Yeah. And they, they don't show you. No. So, you, feel good. yeah. So we do want to be mindful of impact, I think, through, throughout their life, but certainly as they're getting older and making sure that they can access the things that they love. So sometimes you'll see, oh, he doesn't really want to sit on the couch anymore. Now he's chosen you know, the heat register instead of in his favorite window spot. And it might be just because he can't get up there that easily or she can't get there. So make it easy for them. Give them lots of like in between steps. There's lots of different pet stairs. You can make little shelves so that they can easily access things. But they really need those surfaces to also be something they can grab onto. So um, traction. So think about non-skid mats. Um, think about carpeted cat trees, maybe not the modern like super slick wood because some cats are, are going to jump on and just slide right off. So we want to avoid that. And, and we, we have, also... Oh. You ended up with one of those slippery things, or you have a slippery thing that you think you want to use. Mm -hmm. I've actually gotten carpet squares. They make yeah. these carpet squares that have uh, uh, adhesive on the bottom. Like it's like a giant carpet sticker. Perfect. Uh, and it's easy to cut them. Uh, and then you can shape them to whatever you want and just nice. stick them down. Perfect. Uh, I'm in love with those things. Yeah, so that's a that's another great suggestion on how you can modify the things you already have to make them more cat friendly. And really think about blankets, padding. A lot of older cats have lost a lot of fat and um, they're just, they're not as padded as they used to be. And so their bones are gonna be touching everything they're laying on. So think about giving them blankets and um, cushions. And of course, I'm a big fan of heated cat beds um, that plug in. My older cat, um, Clarabelle, she, I think she just went from one heated bed in the house to another. We had four of them. So she would just different times a day, she'd be in a different heated bed, but and she really liked it. About? Like, do you have, do you have any, just, they like it and that's that, or do you think there's anything else to it? Yeah. Well, there's a few things. I mean, one is again, that loss of body fat. So probably a little bit harder for them to maintain warmth. Um, we also know that cats in general like the temperature to be warmer than humans do. So their thermo neutral zone is around 80 degrees, where ours is more like 68 to 72, partly because we wear clothing, but also just, you know, we're, we're evolutionarily a little different. Our bodies are different. Their body temperature is a little bit higher. So um, being conscious of that and, you know, heated beds are a really nice compromise because most of us don't keep our homes at 80 degrees. So... <laughs> <laughs> um, it's the least we can do to keep them happy. Um, but I think it's really soothing for their joints too, right? If you've ever had a situation where you needed a heated 
you know, a little heating pad on your tummy or an aching shoulder. It's, it's a very soothing feeling. So I think we can provide them with a little comfort that way too. It's fantastic. Yeah. And I would just say, be, oh, sorry. I, you're going to say it right now. Go ahead. I was just saying, you know, being conscientious of like where their favorite things are, like how easy is it for them to access food and water? You might need extra food and water dishes. You might need extra litter boxes. You might need more beds, more scratching posts, just so your cat doesn't have to go that far. And when you and I were talking earlier um, offline, you mentioned that if you have a cat that's really having trouble getting around, a heating bed can actually be dangerous. Oh, that's a great point. Yeah. So the the one thing with if you are going to use a, a a heated pad um, is that making sure your cat is physically capable of rolling or getting themselves off it. We don't want any um, scalds. I mean, they get, they definitely get warm. Um, like they feel good, but I could imagine that a cat who could not get away from it, that would be a dangerous situation. And there are alternatives to plug in. So there's the snuggle safe disc, which is a microwavable heated di disc. It's not as squishy, so it's not as comfortable, but some people make the like little homemade, like microwavable rice baggies. Um, there are some um, reflective mats that um, generate warmth from the cat's own body heat. They're not as powerful, but I would say, you know, if your cat is really um, like not that mobile, then you probably only want to use a plug-in heated bed when you're supervising and can move them off it or help them move off it. And those, in any in any of those cases, I know that I've made the rice things for myself when I had a hurt back. And it seems fine when you lay on it and then the rice will move and the center is really, really hot. hot. Yeah. And you can, you can, God forbid, but you can have a heating pad or a heated bed that should be just fine and safe, but it has a glitch. Yeah. So if your cat can't get off of it, you actually can cause some pretty serious burns yes. that can yeah. be life ending. Yes. So, um, so just keep an eye on them. Yeah, exactly. And use a, you know, a product that's made for pets. Um, you know, the human heated pads can also not always be as like temperature controlled. So, um, so yeah, as with anything, lots of, um, you know, care and supervision, checking it, making sure it's working properly. Um, and then let's see. Oh, and then um, I wanted to talk briefly about my favorite topic, which is playtime. Um, and, you know, I think with play and older cats, it really is kind of a use it or lose it kind of situation. So you do want to try to keep playing with your cat. Um, Clarabelle, she played until just a few days before she died. So, wow. um, but you know, it's different. And I think people sometimes stop playing with their cats when they get older because they, it doesn't look like it did when they were kittens. They're not going to be, you know, just running over and tossing the ping pong ball in the air. They're not going to be doing backflips. So you, you really have to, um, use interactive play to motivate your older cat a lot of times to, to move. And you also want to kind of tailor the play to your cat's abilities. So if your cat is weaker, then the prey should be weaker. The bird should be injured. You know, the mouse should be running around more slowly. And, um, you know, the wiggle worm is not wiggling quite as fast as it used to so that your older cat can have success and catch it and touch it and put it in their mouth and enjoy that kind of fun aspect of playing with a, an interactive so toy. If I have, let's say I have an old cat that's 15 and I kind of have um, dropped the ball here and I haven't played with him in years yeah. and basically the cat just sleeps. If I'm inspired by everything that you're saying tonight, what would be your first choice for uh, like, it's like my first day back at the gym. What, yep. what, what do you think is best to get started? Um, put a towel on the couch next to your cat or wherever they're sleeping and move like the stick end of a toy really slowly under the towel, peek out of the little corner of the towel. Um, that's very enticing to cats um, or something small and quiet and move it very slowly. Um, move it on their level. So you might be playing where they are. They're not gonna be running around the house. You're gonna be playing on the couch. They might be laying down. And at this point, play is defined by watching and stalking, which is an important part of cat hunting, which is you know the kind of pre-pouncing behavior. And we might see some batting, maybe some chewing, maybe they'll roll over, but they don't actually even have to run around to play. So they can play where they are and enjoy it. And it's still good mental stimulation. It's good stress reduction for them. Um, but you are thinking more of the um, more strategic stalking part of the hunting sequence than the, they're gonna pounce on this bird and kill it. That's um, no, so I don't have to feel like my cat is gonna be an Olympic athlete just that watching of something and a little batting that's play that's, that's a great starting point they yeah. might 
take it further or they might not. Um, but yeah, I think at that age also using like the sense of um, sound. So like tissue paper, moving the toy under tissue paper. I love this year fun for cats. I put a picture of it there, which is just this like translucent piece of fabric that you can Velcro to different things and you can move the toy underneath it. That's a really great way to um, tempt cats. And it's really tapping into some of their instincts when it comes to play because cats are naturally drawn to like crunching sounds, like a mouse running around in a pile of dry leaves or um, anything that's kind of similar to a mouse hole. Cats are naturally attracted to crevices and like things moving in and out of something like underneath something. And that's why I really recommend the like moving the toy under a towel or a blanket that tends to make a lot of cats very excited. That is an awesome tip. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. And just follow your veterinarian's guidelines. Your veterinarian can tell you, you know, is your cat healthy enough for play? Um, and they can give you some guidelines as to how physical you should be trying to um, engage your cat. Bridget was saying that she, her cat seems to really like uh, YouTube videos. Of nice. Cats. You know, I, I have to wonder about that. I'm so glad that we have a chance to talk about it because do they just get frustrated or it is good? Yeah, I mean, and that is a perfect lead into my last slide or my next to last slide, which is about other types of enrichment for our older kitties. Mm -hmm. um, they can do all the same things that our younger kitties do. It just might be a little adjusted, maybe not as like wild, but yeah, they can um, enjoy YouTube videos. I do There's think that left. There's your kitty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I think that um, what you have to consider is that when cats hunt, they don't catch everything. A lot of times they make a pounce for a bird and the bird flies away, right? So they don't necessarily have to be successful every time. We don't want to exclusively go digital. Like, you know, we don't want to only use the laser pointer. We don't only want to put on the TV for our cats. We always want to alternate it with other forms of tactile and um, olfactory stimulation. So there's lots of things you can do to enrich your cat. But yeah, YouTube videos are one great way of this toolbox of fun things you can do that include food puzzles, um, which I'm a huge fan of. And if your cat is not like the most robust eater, then maybe you just use the food puzzles for treats when they're older, talk to your vet. Um, you know, it really depends on your cat's motivation and how well they're eating. Um, harness walks are great. Um, the nice thing about taking um, Clarabelle out on harness walks is I knew she was not going to um, run away. I mean, she did, actually she did sneak into my neighbor's yard once and got in a fight with her dog, but that's another oh, story. No. Um, when she was 15. Um, but um, for the most part, they're going to be pretty like chill outside and they just want to roll around in the dirt. So what if at the end of your YouTube session, yeah. you had a, a wand toy that you could dangle in and then let the cat catch the thing on the end of the wand toy and then get a little treat? Love it. It's like the perfect smorgasbord of fun things for cats. So yeah, I think- my frustration um, radar feel better. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, yes, absolutely. I mean, I think, um, you know, it, it certainly, like I said, it can frustrate some cats to not catch the toy, um, to only watch the video. I think it really depends on the cat. And so you do have to kind of watch how they're responding. But, you know, when you're in doubt, like try tossing some treats or get out a toy. And if they're still kind of worked up, they will just go right for it. So that's a great suggestion. Um, I love catnip and silvervine and um, honeysuckle, valerian. Those are all examples of olfactory stimulation that older cats can enjoy. Um, tactile stimulation would include like the self-grooming, um, brushing kind of corner comber um, things or anything that your cat can like rub against. Um, I love bird feeders to watch as long as you um, maintain them and sanitize the bird feeders appropriately. Birds can spread disease to other birds. So if you're going to have a bird feeder, you should do it. Um, do it well. Um, yeah, the so you first can... person I've ever heard talk about that. That is a really good point. Yeah, I sanitize my bird feeder once a week. So um, that's no. kind of because I yeah, people, bird feeding can be controversial. So um, and then as mentioned, go digital. So, you know, aside from YouTube, there's, you know, music for cats, there's video games for cats. So really just see what your cat responds to and just make sure they're not getting frustrated. Um, we don't see as much obsessive behaviors in cats as we do with dogs for things like laser lights but um, some cats do seem to get a little like too excited and you know it depends on how you feel about cats playing with your tv as well um <laughs> well, i wanted to circle back when you were talking about olfactory stimulation yeah so sh we've got silver vine not yes. silver vine it's silver vine and the research that i guess it, there's some research that says more cats will react to that than to catnip 
Yeah, it's um, it's very interesting. So it's it's a plant called matatabi, and um, it's definitely gained popularity in the last five to ten years. I'd say as far as how easy it is to find. And um, there was a study. Um, Sebastian Bull was one of the authors of that study that compared cats' responses to different olfactory stimulants. And they found that more cats did respond to silver vine. Um, we do know that about 60 to 70 percent of cats seem to have the catnip gene. Um, we know that that seems to be a genetic trait, although a, a base pause, maybe they're working on identifying the gene, but we don't know the actual um, gene wow. yet. But um, we know from the pattern of inheritance that it is genetic. So um, if your cat doesn't like catnip, try silver vine. They might like that instead. They and might like both. And what else? And honeysuckle. Yeah, Tatian. Uh, it's like, yeah, Tatiana, and I can't say it right, but it is honeysuckle. Is the, yes. And any old honeysuckle? Um, I would look online for cats, honeysuckle, and you'll find um, the products. I think it sometimes comes in like a disc. Okay. So, yeah. Very cool. Um, yeah. And I'll just add one last thing, which is, um, you know, some people think you can't train, uh, you know, teach an old dog new tricks. You definitely can teach older animals to learn tricks or other behaviors with clicker training, positive reinforcement training. So I'm a big fan of using training to um, reinforce behaviors we like, especially when older cats sometimes need medication or more grooming. So those um, that's a really good tool. Definitely beyond the scope of what I can talk about today, but I would just say look it up and look into it. Maybe we can have a, a thing for base paws in the future about clicker training cats, but it's a Ooh, good tool I to love use. love that. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that's yeah. awesome. And just this is the last slide and then we can answer questions. I did want to just um, say, you know, we really want to keep our older cats as stress free as possible because we know stress exacerbates illness. So we can provide our cats with lots of routine. That's one great way, like feeding them around the same time each day, giving them their meds around the same time each day, cleaning their litter box around the same time each day, playing at the same time each day. These are all ways we can provide our cats with stability and familiarity in their environment. Um, social relationships, if you're having problems between your cats or between your cats and people or other animals, then you should really seek out professional help to make that stress go away. And I will say that for most senior cats, now's not the time to get a kitten. Um, you know, I, I've, I've definitely seen situations where senior cats did fine with kittens, but it can be very stressful. So just really think about it before you do that. Um, make sure you're addressing pain. Make sure your cat's seeing veter the veterinarian. Um, as often as is appropriate for their age group. And then I'd say the two things are really just respecting that your cat is going to slow down at some point. Um, they might have medical challenges, they might have behavioral challenges. And so the most important thing when you have a senior is to um, have patience and love them through all of this. Um, this picture is Clarabelle. This was uh, the day that she died actually. Um, she was like my best friend in the world. She was just an amazing cat. And so that was one of the reasons I was really excited to give this talk is just, it's kind of in her honor. She was oh, a really great senior well. and it was an honor to take care of her and medicate her and help her through all of her challenges until she passed. I bet you she's awfully grateful. I think she was, she was a good kitty. Well, thank you so much. Did you have any uh, anything else tonight for us? That's it for slides. I'm ready to answer questions. Yeah, I, I tried to hit them as we went through, but cool. if anyone has any other questions, let me know. And um, we're going to see about coming back next Tuesday. See if we're going to stay on a roll. Um, you know, and you can even, you can adopt a senior kitten, a kitten. <laughs> at, kitten at heart. Um, yeah. And give them a couple of great years of life. And yeah. uh, what, what a gift um, to a cat who's, you imagine if, you know, if you're in a shelter, it's not super, but if you're old and in a shelter, it's really not super. So yeah. maybe if you're planning on a quiet holiday or don't have a lot of other people coming around, maybe get an old kitty and see if yeah. you can enjoy it that way. I well, thank you fantastic. so much. Um, I really appreciate it. And everybody be on the lookout for all the, uh, all the amazing stuff coming from you um, soon. And also uh, your quotes everywhere. Every time I'm reading a cat article, then there you are. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you, Base Paws. Um, what Yay. a great night, as usual. Uh, and we'll see you guys later. Have a great Thanksgiving, everybody. Bye. Bye.